You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you're going to hear another portion of the proof that the government, which calls itself the United States government or the government of the United States of America, that which is constituted within the boundaries of the Federal District of Columbia, is not, in fact, the government of the United States of America. In fact, it is a treasonous, counterfeit, criminal government, and an imposter government, if you will. They have already destroyed the Constitution of the United States of America. It is a done deal. I am proving that nightly. We began this series last night with the 6 o'clock Mountain Time broadcast, and we'll continue until we have gone through all of these 400 pages of documented proof that I have in front of me. Any attempt to stop me from broadcasting this information or from publishing this material will be futile. As we have, we produced 100 copies of all of these documents and have placed them in the hands of 100 of our most trusted intelligence operatives around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the world has been declared upon the citizens of the United States of America. Our nation has been taken from us, and it is a done deal. It is not theory. It's not postulation. It happened a long time ago. I have the proof in front of me, and I'm disclosing it with every episode of the hour of the time. Make sure you have pen and paper by your side at all times. I expect you to research this information. Prove it to yourself, your family, and your friend, and join us in the fight. A legal and rational fight, for we have the law on our side. Those who claim to be representing us in government are traitors. The government itself is a counterfeit, illegal, unlawful, and unconstitutional government, and it is a treasonous organization which is in the process of destroying the United States of America to create a one-world totalitarian socialist order under the United Nations. It began a long time ago, and those of you who began listening to us with our first broadcast today already are aware of that. Don't go away. I'll be right back. solitary, lonely, helpless man, one man with no arms, 
walked upon this earth 2,000 years ago, changed the entire world for the 2,000 years that followed his death. He said, and I quote, My people perish for lack of knowledge, unquote. During this hour, ladies and gentlemen, I will read you from the text of the blueprint for the peace race, outline the basic provisions of a treaty on general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world. This was printed by the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. It is publication number four. United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, publication number four. General Series 3, released May 1962. That's the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, publication number 4. General Series 3, released May 1962. It was for sale by the Superintendent of Documents, United States Government Printing Office, Washington 25, D.C. I quote, Not to an arms race, but to a peace race to advance together step by step, stage by stage, until general and complete disarmament has been achieved. Unquote. Signed by President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, September 25th, 1961. This is a verbatim statement by the President, John F. Kennedy, in a press conference April 18th, 1962. Pay attention. The United States has today tabled at Geneva an outline of every basic provision of a treaty on general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world. It provides a blueprint of our position on general and complete disarmament, as well as elaboration of the nature, sequence, and timing of specific disarmament measures. This outline of a treaty represents the most comprehensive and specific series of proposals the United States or any other country has ever made on disarmament. In addition to stating the objectives and principles which should govern agreements for disarmament, the document calls for the grouping of individual measures in three balanced and safeguarded stages. We are hopeful through the give and take of the conference table this plan will have a constructive influence upon the negotiations now in process. I want to stress that with this plan, the United States is making a major effort to achieve a breakthrough on disarmament negotiations. We believe that the nations represented at Geneva have a heavy responsibility to lay the foundations for a genuinely secure and peaceful world, starting through a reduction in arms, unquote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that sounds very nice. It sounds wonderful. It's the ages-old dream of a thousand years of utopia on Earth brought to fruition through the great work of the many different brotherhoods, the secret societies operating under different names and at times appearing to oppose themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, their plan is coming to fruition very quickly. How would you disarm the world without having a central power and a central police force to enforce the disarmament of the world? And this plan includes the peoples of the world, including the American peoples. All of this really wonderful, utopian-sounding rhetoric that comes from the mouths of these people who have been working to destroy the United States of America lay against your ears like a soft feather on a puff of wind. But the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, that feather always ultimately erupts in a burst of flame that consumes not only the ear, but the head and the body. It is the ages old lie, the promise of something good. And you always have to give up everything to get it. And whoever's calling, you might as well stop because no one is going to answer this telephone. And I continue. Forward. An ultimate goal of the United States is a world which is free from the scourge of war and the dangers and burdens of armaments, in which the use of force has been subordinated to the rule of law, and in which international adjustments to a changing world are achieved peacefully. Today, in a world riven by dangerous tensions and mistrust, 
The attainment of this goal necessitates continuing and patient efforts to achieve the progressive reduction of national war-making capabilities in such a manner as to increase the security of all nations. Thus, responsible arms control and disarmament proposals cannot be directed toward the attainment of unilateral political or military advantage. They must be fully responsive to the legitimate security interests of all nations. On the basis of these considerations, President Kennedy on September 25, 1961, presented to the General Assembly of the United Nations the United States Program for General and Complete Disarmament in a Peaceful World. To provide a more precise statement of the United States' approach to disarmament and the manner in which that approach should be implemented, the United States on April 18, 1962, presented to the conference of the 18-Nation Committee on Disarmament meeting in Geneva an outline of basic provisions of a treaty on general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world. Although not a draft treaty, the outline elaborates and extends the proposals of September 25th and provides a specific term a substantial basis for the negotiation of arms control and disarmament treaty obligations. The principal provisions of the United States outline are described in the summary that follows. The complete text of the outline begins on page 5. Ladies and gentlemen, that also sounds nice. Wouldn't it be nice to have a peaceful world free from war? If you've studied history as I have, you will find out that the wars that have been fought in the last 150 years have been fought to bring this plan of world government into reality. Outline of basic provisions of a treaty on general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world. Summary. Principle and process of disarmament. Disarmament would be implemented progressively and in a balanced manner so that at no stage could any state or group of states obtain military advantage. Compliance with obligations would be effectively verified. As national armaments were reduced, the United Nations would be progressively strengthened. Did you hear that, sheeple? You've been telling me there is no plan for world government? You better wake up. You have been stupid long enough. You've been apathetic long enough. You have been irresponsible and ignorant long enough. There's no time left, as you will soon see. Disarmament would be accomplished in three stages. The first to be carried out in three years, the second also in three years, and the third as promptly as possible within an agreed period of time. Stage one would be initiated by the United States, the Soviet Union, and other agreed states, and that has been done. All militarily significant states would participate in stage two, and that is in the process of being done. And all states possessing armaments and armed forces in stage three. I'll repeat that. And all states possessing armaments and armed forces in stage three. Transition from one stage of disarmament to the next would take place upon a determination that all undertakings in the preceding stage had been carried out and that all preparations for the next stage had been made. Disarmament measures. Armaments. During stage one, inventories of major categories of both nuclear delivery vehicles and conventional armaments would be reduced by 30%. That has been surpassed. Fixed launching pads would be reduced with associated missiles. That has also been done. Half of the remaining inventories would be eliminated during stage two. That is being accomplished at the present time. And final reductions would be made in stage three. Upon the completion of stage three, states would have at their disposal only agreed types of non-nuclear armaments for forces required to maintain internal order and protect the personal security of citizens. Production of armaments during stage one would be limited to agreed allowances and would be compensated for by the destruction of additional armaments to the end that reductions would not be impaired and that has been done. In stage two, production of armaments would be halted except for parts for maintenance of retained armaments. Any further production of national armaments would be ended in stage three except for production of agreed types of non-nuclear armaments for internal forces. 
Military research, development, and testing would be subject to increasing resources during this disarmament progress. During stage three, appropriate action would be taken to ensure that new scientific discoveries and technological inventories and inventions of military significance were not used for military purposes. B. Armed Forces. Force levels of the United States and Soviet Union would be reduced to 2.1 million at the end of stage one, and that has been more than accomplished. Half of the remaining forces of these two states would be disbanded during stage two, and that is being accomplished at the present time and in the United States is well ahead of schedule. And final reductions would be made in stage three. Other states would also progressively reduce their force levels. By the end of stage three, states would have at their disposal only those agreed forces and related organizational arrangements required to maintain internal order and protect the personal security of citizens. Notice that the military force of nations is now turned inward and is not to protect from attack from without, but is to maintain internal order. C. Nuclear weapons. Production of fissionable materials for use in nuclear weapons would be halted in stage one, and limitations would be imposed on the production of fissionable materials for other purposes. The availability of fissionable materials for use in nuclear weapons would be reduced during stage one, and subsequent stages by safeguarded transfers to learn nuclear weapons purposes. That is being accomplished. If nuclear weapons have not already been halted under effective international control, arrangements to this end would be undertaken in stage one. States which had, which had manufactured nuclear weapons would agree in stage one not to transfer control over nuclear weapons to states which had not manufactured them or to assist such states in their manufacture. States which have not manufactured nuclear weapons would refrain from seeking them. That is being enforced at the present time. Transfers of fissionable materials between states would be limited to peaceful purposes and would be safeguarded, and that is being accomplished at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, President Clinton has proposed to resume nuclear testing, and I make this prediction. Not because anyone has told me, not because I'm involved in any of this, but because I know the Brotherhood. If he indeed resumes the testing of nuclear weapons, he will not live to finish out this term. Beginning in stage two, non-nuclear components and assemblies of nuclear weapons would be destroyed and limitations would be imposed on further production or refabrication of nuclear weapons. At the end of stage two, remaining nuclear weapons would be registered internationally to assist in verifying the fact that by the end of stage three, states would not have such weapons at their disposal. That is, at the present time, being accomplished both in the United States and in the Soviet Union. D, outer space. The placing of weapons of mass destruction in orbit would be prohibited in stage one, and limitations would be imposed on the production, stockpiling, and testing of boosters for space vehicles. States would support increased cooperation in peaceful uses of outer space. E, military bases. Reduction of military bases, wherever they might be located, would be initiated in stage two, and final reductions would be made in stage three, and in the United States, this plan has been implemented and is ahead of schedule. F, military expenditures. Military expenditures would be reported throughout the disarmament process, and that is not only being carried out, but it is public information. Verification. The verification of disarmament would be the responsibility of an international disarmament organization which would be established within the framework of the United Nations, and that has been done, and that organization is monitoring the disarmament of the major superpowers. Reductions of armaments and armed forces would be verified at agreed locations and limitations on production, testing, and other specified activities at declared locations. Assurance that agreed levels of armaments and armed forces were not exceeded and that activities subject to limitation or prohibition were not being conducted clandestinely would be provided through arrangements which would relate the extent of inspection at any time to the amount of disarmament being undertaken and to the risk to the disarming states of possible violations. Such assurance might, for example, be accomplished through arrangements under which states would divide themselves into a number of zones or regions through which inspection would be progressively extended. 
By the end of stage three, when disarmament had been completed, all parts of the territory of states would have been inspected. Reduction of the risk of war. To promote confidence and reduce the risk of war during the disarmament process, states would, beginning in stage one, give advanced notification of major military movements and maneuvers. Establish observation posts to report on concentrations and movements of military forces and ensure rapid and reliable communications among heads of government and with the Secretary General of the United Nations. An international commission on reduction of the risk of war would examine possible extensions and improvements of such measures as well as additional measures to reduce the risk of war through accident, miscalculation, failure of communications, or surprise attacks. Arrangements for keeping the peace. In stage one, states would undertake obligations to refrain from the threat or use of force of any type contrary to the United Nations Charter. Throughout the three stages of disarmament, states would use all available means for the peaceful settlements of disputes, would seek to improve processes for this purpose, and would support measures to improve the capability of the United Nations to maintain international peace and security. A United Nations Peace Observation Corps would be established in Stage 1 and a United Nations Peace Force in Stage 2. That has been accomplished. The military forces of the United States that are left are functioning as the United States, the United Nations Peace Force. We are, in fact, in Stage 2 at this moment. The United Nations Peace Force, which would be equipped with agreed types of armaments and would be supplied agreed manpower by states, would be progressively strengthened until in Stage 3 it would be fully capable of ensuring international security in a disarmed world. It would then be turned over completely to the United Nations and would be merged with the military forces of what used to be called the Soviet Union. The outline of basic provisions of a treaty on general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the complete text. I will read, uh, I will read selected portions of this complete text simply because it's what you will is the message, and you will be able to obtain the entire text. In order to assist in the preparation of a treaty on general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world, the United States submits the following outline of basic provisions of such a treaty. A. Objectives. 1. To ensure that A. Disarmament is general and complete. War is no longer an instrument for settling international problems. And B. General and complete disarmament is accompanied by the establishment of reliable procedures for the settlement of disputes and by effective arrangements for the maintenance of peace in accordance with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. You people better wake up. I'm putting my life on the line for you. You better wake up. Two, taking into account paragraphs three and four below to provide with respect to the military establishment of every nation for A, disbanding of armed forces, dismantling of military establishments, including places, cessation of the production of armaments, as well as their liquidation or conversion to peaceful uses, elimination of all stockpiles of nuclear, chemical, biological, and other weapons of mass destruction, and cessation of the production of such weapons. C, elimination of all means of delivery of weapons of mass destruction. D. Abolition of the organizations and institutions designed to organize the military efforts of states, cessation of military training, and closing of all military training institutions. E. Discontinuance of military expenditures. Paragraph 3. To ensure that at the completion of the program for general and complete disarmament, states would have at their disposal only those non-nuclear armaments, forces, facilities, and establishments as are agreed to be necessary to maintain internal order and protect the personal security of citizens. To ensure that during and after implementation of general and complete disarmament, states also would support and provide agreed manpower for a United Nations Peace Force to be equipped with agreed types of armaments necessary to ensure that the United Nations can effectively deter or suppress any threat or use of arms, which means there will no longer be a United States of America, 
for we will have no sovereignty, and the United Nations Charter will be the supreme law of the land, and I tell you now, it already is and has been for some time. I already told you, don't bother, call it. We are not going to answer the phones. We have too much information to give to you. I don't care how angry this makes you. I don't care what you think about it. I don't care if it scares the living hell out of you. I'm going to continue. You're going to hear all of it. Or you can turn off your radio. Or your closet. Put a blanket over your head. Trump the door and lock it. And stay there. Because some of us are damn mad about this. And we are going to stop this socialist takeover of the United States of America. For those of you who think that I may be against peace in this world, you're not playing with a full deck of cards. I am for peace in this world. If we have a voice in deciding how it's going to be accomplished, if we have a voice in deciding whether or not we're going to give up our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, our Creator endowed rights protected by that document, the only document, by the way, in the entire world that ever set man free on the face of this earth. There is no Bill of Rights in the United Nations Charter. There is a clause that outlaws religion unless they are legal. The United Nations has only approved one religion in its history. You go research it. Don't call us and ask what it is. You get off your butts and do some of the work. You've got to help, folks. You must help. We don't have any time left. There's no time left. Period. Paragraph 5. To establish and provide for the effective operation of an international disarmament organization within the framework of the United Nations for the purpose of ensuring that all obligations under the disarmament program would be honored and observed during and after implementation of general and complete disarmament. And to this end, to ensure that the International Disarmament Organization and its inspectors would have unrestricted access without veto to all places as necessary for the purpose of effective verification. B. Principles. The guiding principles during the achievement of these objectives are, one, disarmament will be implemented until it is completed by stages to be carried out within specified time limits. Two, disarmament would be balanced so that at no stage of the implementation of the treaty could any state or group of states gain military advantage, and so that security would be ensured equally for all. Three, compliance with all disarmament obligations would be effectively verified during and after their entry into force. Verification arrangements would be instituted progressively as necessary to ensure throughout the disarmament process that agreed levels of armaments and armed forces were not exceeded. Four, as national armaments are reduced, the United Nations would be progressively strengthened in order to improve its capacity to ensure international security and the peaceful settlement of differences, as well as to facilitate the development of international cooperation in common parts for the benefit of mankind. There's that old benefit of mankind again, that the Brotherhood is so fond of scattering around. Uh, transition from one stage of disarmament to the next would take place upon decision that all measures in the preceding stage have been implemented and verified, and that any additional arrangements required for measures in the next stage were ready to operate. We have been betrayed. We have been lied to. The Brady Bill, all these bills on gun control, that's just dressing on the cake, folks. The cake's already been made. Baked and eaten. It's all over. And it was all over a long time ago. There is no United States of America. There is a United Nations. Our military commanders know this. Congress knows it. The President knows it. The Justice Department knows it. And the Supreme Court knows it. As you will find out in the coming program as I read you verbatim from the law. Don't go away. I'm be back. I just won't be back. And if I am, I guarantee you, you don't want to miss it. Because even if you don't care, it's the best thing on radio.
episode of Beyond the Time reveals more of this absolute proof of the treason and the traitors who are destroying this nation and bringing their men out to territory so first. So, you're going to be taking stock in your preparations. You need two years of prayer food, which we used to furnish at the cheapest price in the entire country. We don't want to do that because we're afraid of you take advantage of it. You'll have to go somewhere else, but you must do it. Regardless of where you get it, you must do it. You need two years' supply of fresh, clean water, and you must be able to keep it fresh and clean. You need to take stock of your first aid supplies. You need to take stock of all emergency equipment, batteries, generators, anything that you can possibly foresee that you could need if there were a total economic and societal breakdown in this country. If there were a civil war, as I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, based upon what I have in front of me, there will be. Not because I say so, not because I want one. It's always been our purpose to try to prevent it, but I'm telling you now, it's too late. It's going to happen. Because you were too slow in waking up. It's beyond the accomplishing the restoration of the Constitution by any political means, I can assure you. At the time of the deal, it's already gone. It's been gone for years. You need to protect your monetary or financial assets, and there's only one thing in the history of the world that's ever done that, folks. That's precious metal in its various forms. And don't get sucked in by these other people out there. Half Swiss America trading. And people call me all the time. So they call Swiss America trading. They gave them what they thought was a good deal. For instance, the lady was going to buy a St. Bonds. $20 gold piece. I think she was going to pay about $800 or $900 for it. She got a little bit of a press and she was getting a good deal. Viking International Trading told her that she was getting cheated, getting kept, getting taken. She said, what do you mean? He said, I can sell you the same coin for $600. Hundreds of dollars less than what you're paying for it. She said, oh, well, is it the same grade? MS-63? He said, oh, yeah, same grade, MS-63 or 64. I forget what it was. Might have been MS-65. I forget. But he said, yeah, it's the same grade. So she called the research center and talked to Carolyn. Carolyn said, you better not do that until you talk to Gene Miller. So she called Gene Miller and talked to him, and she found out the truth. You see, most of you know nothing about numismatic coins, and you're an easy mark for crooks. An easy mark. You see, the coin that Swiss America Trading was going to sell her was a rare coin. Very few coins exist. At that grade, of that specific coin, of that year. Oh, yeah. Viking International Trading was going to sell her the same coin, all right. St. Martin's $20 gold piece. Well, you gentlemen, but it wasn't the same year. It was an year, in which many of them were minted and they're all over the place. And yeah, they could sell it to them cheaper because it's a cheaper coin. But see, she didn't know that. And neither do you. And I know that many of you out there listening to this broadcast right now have heard that from Viking International Trading and from other coin dealers. And since you don't know anything about numismatic coins, you first thought you're sitting there with a coin that probably isn't even worth what you paid for it. I don't know. I don't truly don't know. But I'll tell you, if you went through the scenario that I just described, you got to. And if you want to deal with an honest company, call Swiss America Trading at 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Do it, folks. You'll be real glad that you did. And if you don't, well, you have to find somebody honest out there, and there are other honest people out there. But you're taking a chance because I can personally verify and back up Swiss America Trading with my personal reputation and guarantee. If they ever cheat any one of you, I'll make sure that it's straightened out. And if I find out that it wasn't a mistake that they, in fact, did intend to cheat you, they will no longer sponsor this program. Now, you can't get better than that. Nobody can give you better than that. Call them now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. You'll be glad that you did.
introduction, and remember, I'm only going to read select portions. You will be able to get your hands on this as we publish it. And even if we don't publish it, if you're doing some new research, you will find your own copy without having to go through with us, and then you'll know that we did not make this up, and that's the way that I prefer that you do it. Introduction. The treaty would contain three stages designed to achieve a permanent state of general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world. The treaty would enter into force upon the signature and ratification of the United States of America. Do you hear that, folks? The treaty would enter into force upon the signature and ratification of the United States of America. That was done a long time ago. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republic was done a long time ago, and such other states as might be agreed. Stage two would begin when all militarily significant states had become parties to the treaty and other transition requirements had been satisfied. Stage three would begin when all states possessing armed forces and armaments had become parties to the treaty and other transition requirements had been satisfied. In fact, that has not been implemented and is not a part of the treaty. This armament verification and measures for keeping the peace would proceed progressively and proportionately, beginning with the entry into force of the treaty. Stage one would begin upon the entry into force of the treaty and would be completed within three years from that date. During stage one, the parties to the treaty would undertake, one, to reduce their armaments and armed forces and to carry out other agreed measures in the manner outlined below. Two, to establish the International Disarmament Organization upon the entry into force of the treaty in order to ensure the verification in the agreed manner of the obligations undertaken. And three, to strengthen arrangements for keeping the peace through the measures outlined below. Stage one took much longer than three years. You can mark the beginning of the signing of the treaty by the date that the International the International Disarmament Organization under the United Nations was created. We are now in stage two, ladies and gentlemen. Armaments, reduction of armaments. Specified parties to the treaty as a first stage toward general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world would reduce by 30% the armaments in each category listed in subparagraph B below. Except as adjustments for production would be permitted in stage one in accordance with paragraph three below, each type of armament in the categories listed in subparagraph B would be reduced by 30% of the inventory existing at an agreed date. That has been accomplished. I'm going to skip a little bit now. Methods of reduction. Those parties to the treaty which were subject to the reduction of armaments would submit to the International Disarmament Organization an appropriate declaration respecting inventories of their armaments existing at the agreed date. We have seen members of the International Disarmament Organization visiting uh, arsenals and manufacturing facilities in the United States for several years now. B, the reduction would be accomplished in three steps, each consisting of one year. One third of the reduction would be made during stage one would be carried out during each step. During the first part of each step, one third of the armaments to be eliminated during stage one would be placed in depots under supervision of the International Disarmament Organization. During the second part of each step, the deposited armaments would be destroyed or, where appropriate, converted to peaceful uses that has been done. In accordance with arrangements which would be set forth in a treaty annex on verification, the International Disarmament Organization would verify the foregoing reduction and would provide assurance that retained armaments did not exceed agreed levels. That's been done. Let me skip over to something. Let's see. Arms forces. Reduction of armed forces. Force levels for the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics would be reduced to 2.1 million each, and for other specified parties to the treaty, to agreed levels not exceeding 2.1 million each. All other parties to the treaty would, with agreed exceptions, reduce their force levels to 100,000 or 1% 1 of their population, whichever were higher. Provided that in no case would the force levels of such other parties to the treaty exceed levels in existence upon the entry into force of the treaty, and that has been accomplished. Armed forces subject to reduction. Agreed force levels would include all full-time uniformed personnel maintained by national governments in the following categories. 
A. Career personnel of active armed forces and other personnel serving in the active armed forces on fixed engagements or contracts. B. Conscripts performing the required period of full-time active duty as fixed by national law. C. Personnel of militarily organized security forces and of other forces or organizations equipped and organized to perform a military mission. And, of course, I'm going to skip over the idea of nuclear weapons and outer space. Military expenditures. The parties to the treaty would submit to the International Disarmament Organization at the end of each step of each stage a report on their military expenditures. Such reports would include an itemization of military expenditures. So if we're doing that, folks, what is all this bullshit about national security? Secrecy on the military expenditures when they're turned over to the United Nations. This is absolutely amazing. Specified parties to the treaty would undertake the exchange of military missions between states or groups of states in order to improve communications and understanding between them. Specific arrangements respecting such exchanges would be agreed that has been going on for several years. We have military officers attending the Russian Military Academy. They have military officers attending our military academy. We have now Russian troops on United States soil with their various equipment. We have an open skies treaty, and they are allowed to overfly our airspace any time they want, and we are equally allowed to overfly there. Specified parties to the treaty would agree to the establishment of rapid and reliable communications among their heads of government and with the Secretary General of the United Nations, who is the true, true President of the world, ladies and gentlemen. Specific arrangements in this regard would be subject to agreement among the parties concerned between such parties and the Secretary General. Many of you have called and asked me, Lucas, 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 Gally, thank you, you. He talks to us and other people in the world like he's running the world. Well, you stupid sheep, oh, he is. He is running the world. And it's about time you know it. It's about time you got mad about it. And it's way past time we all started doing something about it. Go read the United Nations chart. Read the resolutions that have been passed by the United Nations. And then you might begin to get a little hint of where we're headed. Right? There are the tattoos. Right down the tubes. I don't know how long my voice is going to last, but I'm going to try to get through all of this, and I'm going to continue until I drop, and Carolyn is getting sick now. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen here, but we're going to continue as long as we can. The parties to the treaty would agree to cooperate promptly and fully with the International Disarmament Organization and to assist the International Disarmament Organization in the performance of its functions and in the execution of the decisions made by it in accordance with the provisions of the treaty. Measures providing for reduction of armaments would be verified by the International Disarmament Organization as agreed to those, and with a full verification of the destruction of armaments and where appropriate verification of the conversion of armaments to peaceful uses. Measures providing the reduction of armed forces would be verified by the International Disarmament Organization, either at the agreed depots or other agreed locations. Measures halting or limiting production, testing, and other specified activities would be verified by the International Disarmament Organization. Parties to the treaty would declare the nature and location of all production and testing facilities and other specified activities. The International Disarmament Organization would have access to relevant facilities and activities wherever located in the territory of such parties. Down the page, uh, all parts of the treaty, of those parties to the treaty to which this form of verification is applicable would be subject to selection for inspection from the beginning of stage one as provided. The reason to do the treaty would divide their territory into an agreed number of appropriate zones 
and at the beginning of each step of disarmament would submit to the International Disarmament Organization in preparation to the total level of armaments forces and specified types of activities subject to verification within each zone. The exact location of armaments and forces within a zone would not be revealed prior to its selection for inspection. That's why the United States has been divided into regions. Both aerial and mobile ground inspection would be employed within the zone being inspected. Access within the zone would be free and unimpeded, and verification would be carried out with the full cooperation of the state being inspected. Once the zone had been inspected, it would remain open for further inspection while verification was being extended to additional zones. By the end of stage three, when all the settlement measures had been completed, inspection would have been extended to all parts of the territory of parties to the treaty. Told you, folks, to Dundee. Requesting the International Court of Justice to give advisory opinions on legal questions concerning the interpretation or application of treaty subject to a general authorization of this power by. Yes, sir. The General Assembly of the United Nations. Requesting the International Court of Justice to give advisory opinions on legal questions concerning the interpretation and application of the treaty subject to a general authorization of this power by the General Assembly of the United Nations. And it continues, and it continues, and it continues, and it includes all nations, all military forces, and all peoples, including you. It was done years ago, ladies and gentlemen. Years ago. Now let me see if there's anything else here that you need to hear right off the bat. Um, yes, here we go. The United Nations Peace Force. The parties to the treaty would undertake to develop arrangements during Stage 1 for the establishment in Stage 2 of the United Nations Peace Force. To this end, the parties to the treaty would agree on the following measures within the United Nations. Examination of the experience of the United Nations leading to a further strengthening of the United Nations forces for keeping the peace. B. Examination of the feasibility of conducting, including promptly, the agreements envisioned in Article 43 of the United Nations Charter. I want you all to read the United Nations Charter and read Article 43. Then, when you have sufficiently recovered, stay tuned for the next hour of the time. Conclusion of an agreement for the establishment of the United Nations Peace Force in Stage 2, including definitions of its purpose, mission, composition, and strength, disposition, command, and control, training, logistical support, financing, equipment, and armaments. The United Nations Peace Observation Corps. The parties to the treaty would agree to support the establishment within the United Nations of a Peace Observation Corps staffed with a standing cadre of observers who could be dispatched promptly to investigate any situation which might constitute a threat to or breach of the peace. Members of the Peace Observation Corps should also be stationed in appropriate and selected areas throughout the world. If upon the expiration of such period of period, that's after group one, time, stage one, two, and three is passed, one or more of the permanent members of the control council should declare that the foregoing circumstances did not exist. The question would be placed before a special session of the Security Council transition to stage two would take place upon a determination by the Security Council that the foregoing circumstances did in fact exist. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I don't know that <laughs> During stage two, the parties to the treaty would undertake to continue all obligations undertaken during stage one. To reduce further the armaments and armed forces reduced during stage one and to carry out additional measures of disarmament in the manner outlined below. To ensure that the International Disarmament Organization would have the capacity to verify the agreed manner the obligations undertaken during stage two, and to strengthen further the arrangements for keeping the peace through the establishment of a United Nations Peace Force and through the additional measures outlined below. 
And, uh, oh, here we go. Now we're getting to the meat of the matter. Armaments. Reduction of armaments. I'm going to skip through all of this military stuff. I'm going to go right there. The British to the treaty would submit to the International Disarmaments Organization a declaration respecting their inventory existing at the beginning of stage two of the additional types of armaments in the categories listed in subparagraph B below and would, during stage two, reduce the inventory of each type of such armaments by 50%. B. All types of armaments within further agreed categories would be subject to reduction in stage two. And we go down to item number eight. Specified types of small arms, which will be declarations by types. That is being carried out in the law now. Under eight. And C. Specified categories of ammunition for armaments listed in stage one. A, subparagraph 1B, and in subparagraph B above would be reduced to levels consistent with the levels of armaments agreed for the end of stage 2. It goes through the method of reduction, eliminating the production of ammunition, eliminating the production of firearms of all types, reduction of armed forces. We're going to be stripped of any means of protecting ourselves against this despotic world government, which will be run and controlled by international socialism. And you will learn that when I get into Mikhail Gorbachev's book called Perestroika, which he recently wrote, and none of you went and bought, and you still have not bought it, and read it from cover to cover. Military bases and facilities. The parties to the treaty would dismantle or convert to peaceful uses, agreed military bases and facilities, wherever they might be located. We would not only dismantle or convert to peaceful uses many, many other military bases throughout this country, but we gave one to Mikhail Gorbachev at the Presidio in San Francisco, and he is sitting there now laughing at us. It is the headquarters of the Gorbachev Foundation. You know what's called with the Gorbachev Foundation here? <laughs> oh, the dear people. If you only knew, if I could just shake you and wake you up. If I could just do something to make you understand what it is that we're losing. If we were given a hand in this, if we were allowed to participate and debate and help form what is coming, we might be able to create something good. Just the fact that it is being brought about through lies and deception and manipulation and the death of many, many good people around the world tells me that there's nothing good about it. In fact, it smells so bad, I can smell the stench right here in our studios under the clear, beautiful blue airs in the sky. It's rotten. The people who are bringing about it are liars and deceivers. They are rotten. Remember? Remember? Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. There is a God, and it is God that you should pray to. Lucifer, Satan, is the great deceiver. Anything born from so many lies and so much deception and so much manipulation is born of Lucifer. I hope you understand what I'm telling you. We're engaged in a war, ladies and gentlemen. A physical, material war, and a spiritual war. And you must, at this time, take sides. You cannot wait any longer. You must take signs. We are at the fork in the road. Jesus Christ said this, He who is not with me is against me. Good night.
and God bless you all. Amen.